five, four, three, two, one. And we are live. Welcome everybody back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Credit Center, CUNY in the City University of New York and in the city um, of New York in the middle of this uh, grim, grim, grim outlook. Um, and we are learning uh, every day more and more about the situation, how it progresses, um, how many more people are infected than we ever knew and the outlook is not, is not good for the US and uh, what is expected. So we are in the epicenter actually here in New York City in the, of the entire planet Earth uh, with most infections and the most dead so far a uh, catastrophic mishandling most probably of a situation and um, and we still have to find out and learn more everything is closed theaters restaurants uh, or bookstores um, life has come to an hold someone has pushed the brake for us uh, on the global global economy and the global way of living and we are experiencing an unprecedented uh, time and um, here at the Siegel talks we do listen to, to artists, theater artists. Uh, that's what we do at the Siegel Center always, where we bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. And, um, but I think, and we all do think that right now is it even more important to listen to voices from uh, the theater and the performing arts from around the world. Uh, artists have been on the right side of history, the right side of social progress. And uh, they are the ones uh, we really should have listened perhaps even more careful before. They, in their works, their plays, their film, their poems, their writings. Uh, they did warn us. There were many, many signs. We didn't take it serious, all of us. And um, so uh, now we are in a situation where um, we are confined to our homes. The world has getting smaller in a way we are connecting to Berlin and India and Pakistan or South Africa in milliseconds, but also our personal life is smaller. We move uh, in from rooms to rooms, move things, right, connect, but the life as we know it is not happening at the moment and uh, there's lots of uncertainty. We do not know where it goes, but also it is a time to think, a time to find meaning, create new meaning, to uh, listen especially also and perhaps uh, uh, reflect on what we have been doing, everybody. We had on also said we lived too fast, too much. We did not really embrace the change that was needed and. Uh, and often crises are needed, as we know from theater, uh, to, to come to a solution or a new solution or to find our ways back to what was right. Um, oh, today, uh, we have a great uh, uh, artist with us, one of the great uh, workers in the vineyard of theater and performance uh, globally, uh, Lula Arias uh, from uh, Argentina, currently in Berlin since a year working with the great Gorky Theater, who was last year also um, for the Pinball Voices Festival, the sixth place uh, from the Gorky. And uh, Lola has been at the Siegel Center also uh, before. And um, she's a writer, uh, she's a director and filmmaker. Her work has been very, very influential. Uh, Performance Research just published a book uh, on her work with my colleague, Jean Graham Jones. Uh, I guess all the uh, 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 tours, the book tours and talks have been canceled, I guess. So Lola, first of all, uh, welcome, tell us uh, where you are, what time it is, and in what neighborhood you are hanging out in Berlin. Mm -hmm. I'm in Berlin, Kreuzberg. It's 6.03. 6, 6 6.03. So um, how does it feel for an Argentine Latin American theater maker who moved to Berlin to enjoy the city, work there, bring your art, your, your, and now you are confined to your home? Well, I mean, I think for all of us, it's hard to be confined. Uh, but I guess it's hard when you have your family um, somewhere else and you know you are not able to travel if something goes wrong. So I think this is the most, like, um, personally, the most difficult thing to deal with that I have. Um, my father is 86 and he's in Argentina. And sometimes I wonder if something happens and I won't be able to travel. I can't be there if he needs me. And this is sometimes like the hardest, uh, like in a personal way. In a professional uh, way, I'm, 
I'm happy to be here because I had been like working a lot at Gorky and developing projects with artists from all over the world that happen to be here in Berlin. And I have the feeling that there are many things that are happening during these Corona times within the art field and people are gathering and thinking together about strategies. So I'm happy to be in a city where also a lot of people gather like with very, very different backgrounds and coming from different cultures, different realities. So the like, the common thinking of how to go on is always very rich because people have many different experiences in their own own countries. Mm -hmm. So how how is the situation in Berlin at the moment? We heard a bit from Thomas Ostermeyer some weeks ago, but how is it? For how long have you been confined? Uh, I know you have a five year old daughter with you, uh, and son. Uh, <laughs> a son, a five year old son with you. Uh, sorry, um, and. Um, so for how long and uh, how is it? Yeah, Do people I mean, wear masks? Was... Can you go out? Is he going to kindergarten again? Yeah. No, basically since um, I was in, in Italy in February when everything started in Italy. So I arrived to Italy because I was supposed to make a project in Italy, in Bologna, yeah. in the north of Italy. In Bologna. In, in April and May. And I, I am supposed to be now in Italy. <laughs> So I was like rehearsing a project called Lingua Madre, Mother uh, Tongue, in Italy. But in fact, I traveled to Italy in, the, in February to make a workshop to choose the protagonist of the, of the play. And the day we arrived, the next day, the whole like theaters were closed and everything, the lockdown started from one day to the other. But it was such a shock that we didn't even know what was going to happen. And at the beginning we thought, okay, no, we stay and we find a way to make our workshop and meet with people. Even if the theaters are closed, there, there is a way to start gathering and so on. But then we realized that it was very fast, very dramatic in Italy. And we had, in fact, we stayed for two days and then we had to leave. And if we would have stayed more, maybe I was not able to come back to Berlin. So. It was quite a <laughs> difficult moment to decide to like to give up the project and come back to my family in Berlin. But um, nevertheless, I continue working with the people in Italy. So now we develop um, a system that we are doing like Zoom uh, rehearsals or workshops where we start to research on the topic because the topic of this piece was, I mean, was uh, reproductive rights, motherhood, and different ways to, in a way, understand the, the rights to, to be a mother when and how you want to, to make it or not make it. And in a way, we, uh, we were researching with a very different group of, of mainly women, like trans women or lesbian women who had uh, children with other women, women who had been through in vitro treatments or uh, women who made adoptions, um, uh, men who made surrogacy in the States. And we were like exploring the issue of, of, yeah, of, of how this uh, tension between the law and the rights for you to, like, to invent your own way to be a mother or a father or to create your own family in the way you want it and what how many things we are like struggling with and it was it's very interesting and the project is ongoing so we continue doing like these zoom meetings where we discuss these issues and we do like uh, theater exercises through the zoom sometimes they are have to perform or to bring a photograph and, and um, small text they wrote uh, their documents on their, their um, in a way, struggles to get recognized as parents, mm -hmm. um, their struggles to get in vitro treatment, their struggles to get their adoptions. Um, and it's very, very interesting because you realize that this is um, also something that is very less uh, discussed. Also yeah. about abortion, about, um, yeah, recognition of, of of different kinds of ways of being a family. Um, mm -hmm. 
So or not being a family, yeah. Not being a family. And, uh, and now we are back in a way to that core unit um, of families or we uh, hear so often that people do say, oh, I go back to my family and everybody assumes it's a cookie mm-hmm. cutter or a shape or everybody has a family or everybody has kids or everybody is married and lots many are on their, or live on their own uh, or they are in a partnership but cannot see each other because they are not uh, legally um, um, uh, with a paper uh, connected like in France where you really exactly. can yeah. only see. I so that it raises so many questions. Yeah, I think it was also interesting to hear, like, for example, now in Italy, I mean, the abortion is legal, but it's like uh, in the society is really, it's more and more like in the US now there is this like questioning this abortion mm-hmm. laws and like mm-hmm. asking why is the abortion still mm-hmm. uh, possible? Should we go back? Should we forbid abortion? And this was happening also a little bit in, in Italy and there was a lot of like right like pro-life uh, demonstrations in front of the hospitals and people like trying to go back with the legislation. And with this mm-hmm. coronavirus, they even said like that the hospital shouldn't be doing yeah. abortions mm-hmm. now because it's not something that is really needed. So that in the yeah. moment where the where the like health system is about to collapse, then why don't we just mm-hmm. I, I, like take advantage of this whole crisis to to suspend abortions to yeah yeah we just had uh, yesterday a, a heartbreaking call from uh, from Hungary with Andrea Tompa the dramaturg and writer and Anna Lengel and they said that uh, the same is happening there that uh, during Corona time politics and politicians abuse uh, powers they now unprecedented unchecked actually in Hungary and that one of the uh, state ministers or officials said, you know, if people would follow the Ten Commandments, 80% of the illnesses wouldn't exist. And, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, it's, it's a, shocking, uh, a shocking time in Poland. Uh, some areas have been declared gay and lesbian free. Um, there's violence uh, on the streets against minorities and it's um, um, complicated. Any news from Argentina? I know you are not so close, but still you grew up there. Your life has been formed. No, no, I'm very close, what, of course. Tell I us a little bit what's going on there. The community of artists. Uh, no, I think they are, like many people are discussing how can they continue with their own like practices, with their artistic practices. And I know that there is a group of independent uh, theater makers who are also living on their own like studios where they teach and they also present a place in a very small um, yeah in, a, in like really small studio sometimes they do pieces for 50 people or even less 30 people and they are trying to create a protocol on how to continue with their activities during the corona time without like uh, infringing any like health uh, legislations or regu- regulations. So they are trying to invent a way to do theater. Which so I people think still meet live in a room? 50 no, people? No, they don't meet yet. They don't meet yet, but they are trying to create this protocol to be able to do it in the near future. So, because they all had be- like had moved into the virtual um, format and they keep teach acting via Zoom and they do their rehearsals via Zoom and they do streamings of their li- of their plays online with this like way that, <laughs> that you can collaborate or put money like, like in a way donate money to the company. But they are trying to create a protocol to be able to perform again live in front of people and with people on stage. And this is, I think, very interesting. I don't know how far they are now because they are like having meetings to create this protocol and how this could be possible, but this is what they are like trying to. Protocol in sense of social distancing, where they, how far people see the audience. It's a, how many people, other, which yeah, distance yeah. between them, what mm-hmm. kind of, uh, like how do, should they be inside with masks, without masks? Uh, yeah, how big should the space be? How much space in between the people? Yes, mm-hmm. trying to create like a kind of regulate, like a, how do you say that? Yeah, regulation on how mm-hmm. this should be. And how, how is the situation as far as you know in Argentina? Are there the memories of the shadows of a dictatorship of an authoritarian state? Uh, are they uh, getting longer? Are they also approaching? Or do you feel Argentine uh, society and artists are experiencing a moment 
No, I think, I mean, I think we are very lucky that this crisis happened with the, uh, like the current president, Alberto Fernandez and Cristina Fernandez, and not with the previous one, because I think he's been very, um, very cautious and, and he has been, like, he did the lockdown from the beginning in a very, like, conscious way i mean and even if it has been very hard because people can't go out uh, like not even for sport or anything and they just can go out for shopping and only one member of the family can get out and the children are locked in since weeks and it's and if you want to visit your own parent you have to have like a permission by the state so it's very very strict but on the other hand i think like it was clear that the health system in Argentina wouldn't survive a, like a big explosion. So I think they did the right thing. And in fact, the figures are showing that they did the right thing. Um, but of course, now there is a lot of pressure on the sides of like that. There is a lot of people who can't cope with the privilege of like staying at home because they can't uh, survive because they have no nothing to, they have, their, they have no money, they have no, and there is a lot of people who are like now queuing for one sandwich in a in one of these uh, food uh, food shares. I don't know how to call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Food kitchens. Mm -hmm. Food kitchens. Um, so I think the, the 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 yeah the big issue is now how all these people will survive under this condition if this. Um, Yes, if these regulations are extended over time, mm -hmm. and of but course, it, mm -hmm. yeah, no, and of course there are also extreme situations like, uh, like the in the slums in the Villa 31, uh, in the barrio Padre Mujica, where there is no water, so it's a part of the city where people are living like in very precarious conditions, and now they have no water since ten days, and the and there is an explosion of cases. So and you there's no water at all. No water, no water at all. So you cannot ask for people to wash their hands and then like they have no water. Like stay home and you have no water, no food, no nothing. So it's yeah, like in some refugee camps, Syrian ones, people say, yes, we would like to wash our hands, but we do not have soap, we do not have water. But has there been no water before in these uh, areas or how they came by? Well, the, it is a very uh, complicated situation in this whole, like Visha Trenta, you know, but since 10 days, this has been the case that they have no water. So now, yeah, there is a lot of pressure from like um, organizations to try to make visible this situation mm -hmm. so that something can be done. Argentina has such a great theater scene and so alive. Uh, Buenos Aires, we also film, television and theater does make so many groups and everything. But now in a time of Corona, um, are there programs to help artists? Like you are successful representative of that fantastic, a great long culture uh, of theater and performance. But do you get help from Argentine government? Uh, others, I don't get uh, help myself. I know that there is some small help by the Institute of Theater. But like, because there are some people who already had like shows that were like bought by the, by certain institutions and they could get some small money, but it's really very, very small. Very, very little, yeah. And we... they, and basically what is happening is that people are like other, like that the state theaters or like the independent theaters are streaming and asking for a donation. That's what happens, like that's the, way people try to to yeah, get some help but it's also very hard some people also started to like give their own classes online and so on but also there the people who like usually pay the classes they are also in a very fragile situation so it's hard also to keep paying a theater uh, class or a dance class when you don't know how to pay the rent so yeah, that's uh, uh, of course. This microeconomy is completely uh, uh, endangered in New York City. So many artists, also for theater, but also musicians, for the next nine, ten months, everything has been canceled. Every gig has been canceled. Musicians and artists who you know used to work um, with different projects, um, some playwrights even experienced the commission they had 
been signed, uh, if by the steel dealer would say, we don't uh, give you the money we uh, are supposed to give you because this is not going to happen. And I mean, even ongoing, there are prominent playwrights um, in the US. So um, it is, a, it is a, a, a tough situation. What is your take on doing work online or Zoom fast or to create something? Do you watch, do you watch a new work created online in Zoom time, in Corona times now? on Zoom, uh, what do you, are you considering doing that? Sorry, it was interrupted. Yeah. Yeah, I'm back. Mm -hmm. uh, did you hear my uh, question? No, <laughs> yeah. sorry. Um, that's okay. Uh, um, so many people, or so many artists feel um, now, they say we have to do something great on the screen. Um, and they do work for screen, create one. Richard Nelson did a, a work on the public. I think 35,000 people looked at it within five days. Oscar Eustace just told us who was on, who, by the way, also had corona. I didn't know that for four or five days. He was in a hospital, I think, in Brooklyn one night. He had to spend in the hallways and uh, while being responsible for 270 people at his theater, which had to close down and he had to make all these decisions, not knowing for him, even if he would survive this, it's uh, just incredible. But um, so are you thinking about creating online content? Uh, um, what is your, are you watch your, do you watch your colleagues and do you think it's a good idea? Yeah, I'm actually, yes, I'm doing now a program on, of lecture performances uh, that will start in the middle of May called My Documents. This is a program that I'm already doing since many years. I started it in 2012 in Buenos Aires. And it's basically a program in which I invite artists from different disciplines to work on their own personal archives. And it's called My Documents because it's this idea of this like folder in the screen, like a folder in your computer where you have these things that you accumulate, these obsessions that you don't know why you are like keep uh, that you keep accumulating for years or these, um, yeah, these, these investigations that you never manage to, to translate into a, an artistic work. And this um, program will have a new version, which it will be a virtual version with artists that are all over the world. So there will be uh, Tim Etchells from London making a work on his um, and his notebooks over 35 years. Uh, Javi Moret from Berlin, uh, working on archives on the Lebanon, on Lebanon war and post-war. Um, there will be uh, Lagartijas Tiradas al Sol from Mexico, working also on an archive of diaries. There will be uh, Tania Bruguera from Cuba and uh, Mengji Chang from China. So it will be really like different artists um, developing these lecture performances that will happen live. Uh, and Pedro Penin from, from Portugal, who is living in Rome. So basically they will be sharing these archives through this share your screen when you just like open your computer to the world. Mm -hmm. But is your <laughs> now we are opening our living rooms to the world, but with this project, we open our computers to the world, our obsessions, our, like our computers became like an extension of our brain somehow. Mm -hmm. So basically we're opening our brains uh, and sharing these um, obsessions with the audience. And we have also, I mean, I can show something if you want. But just before we do this, do you, um, so you had this lecture performance before, but now during mm -hmm. Corona, you had the idea, I'm going to invite artists I respect, like significant artists, to create, uh, is it a performance then? Is that or? Is, yes, it's a lecture it is performance. A performance. So, so they perform and uh, instead of a yeah, play or a written Zoom, play or an interview. Live. Yeah, they will do it by Zoom live. So they will be like performing for a group of people. So you have to, in a way, also send an email and you will be part of this virtual space as, a, as an audience. It won't be a streaming, but like, a, like you will be in this Zoom uh conference with them and then there will be streaming afterwards but first of all there will be this encounter this virtual encounter between the artist and this and the audience and uh yeah and this will be done like friday and saturday since the middle of may until the end of june and this is a co-production 
uh, uh, it starts on the 15th of May. So every two weeks or, or something? No, no, every week, Friday every and week. Saturday, every mm. week, middle of May till the end of June. And this is a co-production between Musantum, uh, Frankfurt, Kampenagel, Hamburg, uh, Munich, uh, and Kaserne Basel. Fantastic. So it's like a, se several theaters came together to, to make these projects. So it was my idea, but I convinced. Mm -hmm. Quite. <laughs> so so did, and then, did the Corona like, time now, you, did it influence, did, that, did it change something or do you have the idea anyway before? No, I've been doing this program, as I said, since 2012, and I did like almost every year, year I did an edition. I did many editions in Buenos Aires. I did some editions in Milan. I did one in February in Lisbon. Um, so in fact, for me, this, this program is something that I do since, a, since many years. And for me, it's a way to connect with other artists and to think together about mm -hmm. how to work with our own obsessions, our, our materials that usually we don't work with. Uh, like our failures also. It's also, it's not a TED, it's the contrary of a TED talk. Is about failure. Is about <laughs> obsession. Is about the things we do when we don't know what to do. Um, so, in a way, this is something that I'm all, that I've been interested in for for a long time. And now the difference is that we are doing this virtual version that allows me to invite people from mm, different parts of the world, which I could never do. In yeah, a, and normally it was live in a theater, or you probably it was live in a theater, but <clears throat> it had already like the elements that that for me were also like that that there was the presence of the artist and the computer because mainly like mm. when people talk about their own archives they have them in their computer so it was basically there was always like a table and a computer and an artist and a screen behind and sometimes the artist would dance or do crazy things or bring a lot of objects or whatever but the minimum format was the artist and the computer. So I thought this is like, has a lot of potential to be done in the virtual um, Which the world. Format. So you adapted it now um, for the corona yeah. time. So it's in a way performing uh, knowledge, performing uh, what you know about, what your research at the great project at the Graduate Center to uh, our uh, students, Amir Farjoun and Corey Tamra developed that. For two years we do this, we invite uh, students from all the 30 PhD programs to perform their research, their project and the failures, what's working, what's not working. And so this is a fantastic uh, um, idea. You have here an adaptation of an existing idea in a new form. Um, yeah, so maybe if you if you have, I, I haven't seen that, if you have a little yes, something you can like show us. One, in fact, this is it's not totally uh, done yet, but it's like, I would share my screen, so I will do it. Okay, so we are, are we the first to see that? Uh, yeah, yes, I think so, talk. because it's not totally, not a totally okay, it's a draft. ready. It's a draft. Okay. Yeah, it's a draft of a one minute of, a, of the lecture performance of Pedro Penin. Okay. That, that he's like working on it. And this will be the first lecture performance. It's called Doing It. And I won't tell more. I just uh, show, mm -hmm. like suddenly Pedro Penin will appear in my computer mm -hmm. as if Okay. okay. Inside of my computer for a long time. For a long time. Yeah. Maybe tell us a little bit about it while we watch. Pedro Pellini is a writer and um, a theater director from Portugal, from Lisbon, and he's now living in, in Rome. And he did this lecture performance in February when we did actually, when we did the, the live lecture program mm. of lecture performances live in Lisbon in Teatro de Barrio Alto. He was there. So basically, now we adapted. This, mm -hmm. oh, this existing lecture performance. Other artists are really inventing complete new uh, things. So I will share my screen, moment. Okay. And yeah, let's see if you see what I see. You see black? Yes. And then it comes. There is nothing that he fears more than talking about it. Because talking about it, as it turns out, is, is hard for him. It has always been a, a sort of secret and, and it might also be a kind of an issue. 
and because there are only three people in the world who know about it. Well, I mean, now there is more. Yeah, so now even even more than the three people will know about it. Um, so it's kind of a sharing of a secret knowledge or a private knowledge or something stored on our hard drives. On yeah, our in brains. this case, I will just like give a bit of more information. Uh, his lecture performance is on his obsession with islands. So basically, mm -hmm. it's like somebody that is talking about how um, he travels to isolated islands like in like and he get lost on these like virtual travels and he did this before corona but i thought it was so like for this moment when we get lost in the internet in the sea of internet when we travel like with google maps because we cannot travel anymore like to have this lecture reflecting on what it means why there is this desire of getting lost or being isolated because he's also talking about the desire of being isolated now we are like obliged to be isolated but he speaks mm -hmm. about this desire of, of going far and away uh, he talks about misanthropy about solitude about uh, yeah many things but it's it's really interesting but he's basically traveling to unknown mm -hmm. islands and also collecting like crazy stories about islands mm -hmm. that we never heard about before yeah, that's great. I think the, the great Edouard Glisson, who actually taught at the Greater Center, also had this idea of the archipelagos, where he said, is they're all islands? And he used it as a metaphor for the world of phonology. The islands, the, the individual islands, and they have their own systems, but all together they form a landscape. And we have to see the world not as one big island, like the US, North America often does. Mm -hmm. uh, that is one gigantic big island. No, they are islands with many islands, and together they form something and perhaps corona is now uh, connecting again this idea of the archipelagos and uh, hearing mm -hmm. from around the world uh, on those islands so from him it will remind us speaking of uh, solitude or loneliness are you experiencing that no i'm missing loneliness <laughs> no Tell i mean us. because <laughs> no because like this like living with a i mean i'm with my partner and my son like 24 hours a day mm -hmm. and sometimes i miss this like solitude now i have it because they are like somehow gone but i miss mm -hmm. this solitude in terms of like like being able to also have time for my own to write and to think mm -hmm. but of course i'm also um missing people so much i mean missing the contact the the touch the like yeah the feeling mm -hmm. of people even if when you walk outside, you see that there is people and this is already comforting because sometimes you feel like so alone <laughs> that mm -hmm. you like might forget that there is others uh, outside. But when you go outside and you see them, it's already comforting. This is something that is very special. Like we are like, I realized that like now, for example, in Berlin, uh, you can start to go to the shops or to the post office, which I like suddenly rediscovered the post office. Like we are sending postcards to the friends of Remo that he doesn't see. So like every week we send two or three postcards to other kids and we receive postcards from other kids that lives in the same city, but we cannot see them. So we send each other postcards. And in the queue of the post office, there is a, um, a homeless person that puts music. So he like creates a kind of atmosphere in the queue of the post office. And then the people like are like waiting <laughs> with one meter 50 distance. And with the, he puts some like pop music and people start to chat with each other <laughs> in the queue. And then suddenly I realized like we never speak with strangers in the streets. And now we are so like, like so much like missing like social contact and people that we start to speak with people in the queue and to mm -hmm. like be more aware of like the people the actual people that we see every day in a big city and being more like uh -huh, acknowledging that they are there and saying hello or having small talks with people um, i think that's also already very mm -hmm. impressive yeah, so in a way you are alone, but not really alone. You are with your family, but not with all the family, uh, all your friends outside. So it's, it's, these are strange 
strange time. So if you say you miss the loneliness you have as an artist, what do you do? How do you how do you find that in normal days? How how or the the solitude? How do you create? That? Yeah, I mean the solitude of 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 writing. I miss because this is the only act, activity I really need, like solitude to write and to think about ideas. And this needs like like a lot of like silence around. So you go to a library or where do you? No, do you usually no. Usually I do it at home or I have like sometimes I have studios or like a small office or a small room somewhere else, but mainly like. The house is not like full all the time, so I have mm -hmm. this yeah, already yeah. at home. Um, no noises, yeah. Yeah, and I also miss the rehearsal room very much, like the experience of this every day, like meeting the people. I'm used to be surrounded by 20 people when I'm rehearsing, like the performers, the technicians, the, the other artists. So this like small community that you see every day and you, and you also have this concentration of like being together. This is also something that I actually miss a lot. Yeah. And do, so do you write at all now in Berlin, in Kreuzberg, where you are? Do you find yes, moments right. in the day? How does your day look like if you can walk us through the day of uh, Lola Arias in Berlin? And it's very, uh, it's changing very much uh, in the different weeks. Now I do a lot of like everybody, I'm doing a lot of like Zoom calls with people just to organize things and keep things going. Also to do this program of lecture performances. I'm talking with artists. I mean, the other yesterday I was talking with this artist in China. She's coming from Hubei province, from Hubei province, the really like the epicenter where everything mm -hmm. where everything started. started. Yeah. And she like is telling me about her artistic uh, research on on the memory of the farm mine in China and like all like things that I wasn't uh, so aware of. And that's that was also quite interesting. Like how I'm now like much more connected with people other artists through these Zoom meetings that I'm always having. Then there is a time when I write, if I manage to have this moment of concentration and writing, and I'm writing now a book uh, called like Portraits of um, Known, and that would be the title, Known and Unknown People, like Personas Conocidas y Desconocidos. Uh, known and Unknown People, mm -hmm. yes, would that mm -hmm. be? So I yep. try, I'm, I'm doing this, uh, like I have this crazy idea of like, like making a portrait of every pe people, uh, every person I met, which is completely impossible, of course. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, trying to make the, like the, you know, the credits of the film of your life and put mm -hmm. like all, all the names at the end of, the, of this film. It's all also almost like writing your own uh, epitaph because it's like Fantastic. Like, yeah, like, yeah. like 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 trying to gather like all the people you met in your life is also going through your life and this mm -hmm. is like what i'm doing now i'm trying to make this book which is a project for one publishing house called ripio in buenos aires and and then i'm sometimes also writing a diary of a of a morning or how you, do you call it like this yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, my mother died uh, some months ago. I'm so sorry I'm writing, to hear that. Yeah, thank you. I'm writing about this, and this is also like very, um, very special experience to write about lost, loss, and yeah, and what happens after that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm reading this beautiful book by Roland Barthes called the, the Diary of the Morning. I think it's somewhere here. Yeah. Yeah, he wrote this beautiful book when his mother died mm -hmm. and it's full of like amazing like it's really like small notes on mm -hmm. on this process and he says it's not a process that's also interesting he says everybody tells me that that the mo morning how do you say morning morning, morning. Mm -hmm. morning. it's a process yeah. but i feel it's we are i'm always in the same um yeah, in in the same state. It's not it's not a process. It's like I'm going back and forth, and I don't feel that I'm getting mm -hmm. rid of linear. Mm -hmm. of my mother, but more that I'm getting like deeper into a feeling that I never had before. And I think, yeah, probably I think the death of our mothers 
or the, mm -hmm. yeah, the parents is one of the most mm -hmm. existential experiences we've yeah. all had. Tell us about or your mother. Well, tell us a bit about her. Uh, she was a literature teacher, basically, and um, and she was someone very, very uh, interested in art. And she was like a person that taught me piano and uh, took me to dance lessons and uh, theater lessons. And she was always like encouraging like artistic practices in all ways. And she was herself, I think, um, a, a great writer, but she never really wrote a book, but more like essays because she was a literature professor at the university also. And she wrote like more like essays or, but she also wrote some small texts only for herself that, um, that we, that she read only in like family occasions or strange situations. And they were so beautiful. I always thought she should have been a writer. Probably if she wouldn't have had three kids, three children, <laughs> she would have had more time for, for writing her own literature. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, important. We <clears throat> plan to have an uh, event with Adrian Kennedy, a great uh, uh, African American pioneering uh, playwright from the 60s. And so, I mean, it's fantastic work which she did. One of her beautiful works is uh, People Who Led to My Plays. And she has little paragraphs, like almost like dictionary entries of um, thoughts, memories of her childhood, but also people she met, uh, actors, uh, movie stars, or. Um, Travel she made and she connects these kind of little islands as one we as earlier to a little the archipelago to a big bigger um, picture is a beautiful um, 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 way of um, creating a, a memory. Um, do you feel that this Corona time is a time for you that is formative for you? Is it changing something or um, is it an interruption and then life will will go back? Or do you feel something is happening? You will not I expect. Think I was thinking about this book of Naomi Klein. This changed everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had it like now here in Bubble mm -hmm. Climate Change. And, and I think, yeah, this should change everything, but in, the, in a positive way. I think. What should change? Like uh, everything, like, <laughs> like uh, I mean, we should, I mean, from climate change, like we realize like suddenly, like uh, planes are not, flying anymore and there are like animals <laughs> taking over the cities and and somehow the air is <laughs> clear and like there is like the nature is taking like back no it's like when we when we the the humans like step back a little bit the nature somehow grows and the animals are back and, and I don't know I had a feeling that this is also needed that we step back with many things, with um, yeah, with pollution, with uh, like the idea of like this hyper productivity and um, and the amount of of like this idea that we are, that the economies have to always grow. It's I think this is all like a bit in question now. I think that the problem is how to interpret these signs, and there are people also saying like now that there is this big economical crisis we should like like be more uh, strict and more um, and we, do, we should forget about climate change because people are starving and that's justification is also um, very weird because we should create new works for renewable renewable energy we should invent uh, new ways of of taking care of the earth and of each other we should like reinforce uh, um, health education like state intervention uh, i think this is like something that became became very clear um, and what's happening in the us is also i think it's very brutal because it shows like how how hard it is when like when, when a country is driven by, by this idea, a neoliberal idea that the market does it all. And then you have like a whole health system collapsing and, and, and how many people had been fired 
yeah. 30 million people filed uh, for employment people within four without, weeks. Yeah. Without work and like it's really, it's, it's a total disaster. And I think it's very, yeah, I think it should be a moment of change, yes. But the, but yeah, you have to see how to you get rid of this, mm -hmm. <laughs> this maniac that is running the boat. Mm -hmm. Will you also change something in your life? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think I'm changing something, a little bit something every day um, in terms of like the way I relate to, to things, even like to my own, I never, I never, um, I never pay attention to things in the house. I'm always like into my thoughts and running from one thing to the other. Now I'm taking care of the plants and of the, wish, of the dishes. <laughs> and today the washing machine got broken. And for the first time in my life, I repaired the washing machine <laughs> with a YouTube tutorial. Great. So, <laughs> so suddenly I feel like, okay, I can be self-sufficient and blah, blah, blah which is also a bit absurd, but, um, but somehow these like small feelings of how important are these everyday uh, connections, mm -hmm. like very terrenal, terrenal things, like very mm -hmm. like everyday things. Um, but also I'm more and more thinking because I'm, uh, I'm also like uh, working on an, on, on, on a project with elderly people for next year um, for a theater in Hanover. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking a lot about like the situation of aging and how it became so now so um, relevant to discuss how do we want to age and how do we want to like take care of the people who are aging and how do we make ourselves responsible for them? How do we share our time? Uh, with people who is going to take care of us and of our beloved ones uh, in the end of our lives. I think this is something like that we all have to think about so much that we are like um, this like euphoria of youth and beauty and whatever. We are always like denying that this will come to us and that this is already there that there is a lot of people that are out of the public uh, discussion, out of the public space, out of the political uh, agenda, out of the, yeah, nobody even talk about what, a, what your sex life will be like when you have 80, I don't know, maybe there are things to discover. And, and I think that's also something that I'm now interested in, in thinking and researching. Um, and I'm starting now, it's a very difficult moment to start like interviewing and talking to people. I'm starting with people who, who are, I mean, that I can interview online or like through Zoom and so on, but I want to do this project live. So it's, mm -hmm. it will be a mm -hmm. challenge also. Um, yeah, and I was reading a novel that was written by Bioy Casares <laughs> in 69 almost 50 years ago, which was called uh, The Diary of the War of the Pig. And it was about a world in which the young people started to hunt the elderly people because of, nobody knows because of what, because they smell, because they are greedy, because they are ugly, because we don't like them, because we are afraid of becoming one of them. But they start to hunt them and to beat them and to get them like, we don't want to see them anymore. And this novel written like 50 years ago, it made me think so much about this process that we are living now, where like elderly people are also marginalized from public life. And also even like with the excuse of taking care of them, we are also isolating them even more. So I think it's very, it's very, um, it's a very urgent question to think about. Yeah, how, how to handle the crisis also like taking care of their of what they need besides like being healthy or like. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the, yeah, the dignity, uh, even yesterday in our talk with Hungary, which is still on my mind, I think Orban, the led, uh, autocrat, uh, ordered that 60% of all patients and hospitals need to leave, no matter what condition, even terminally ill people. So they have Corona beds free for the statistics, even though they weren't be stop yet. 
and nine out of ten a nurse said people died uh, in their homes on the streets uh, and a complete disregard disrespect and this was all um, what we're experiencing here in quarantine that we are confronted in a way with death that's always there we had uh, RST Tarnaga, who said 400,000 people die of malaria and uh, every day. We don't even have the money for measles vaccinations. Um, this has been going on for a very, very long time. The system is not working. It's not right. And things um, will have to change and should change. In your artistic practice, do you think it will also have serious consequences or your wonderful work, your, the future land work about immigration and all this, the, the theater of war, the film you did. I mean, you already developed new forms and uh, which we all admire, but do you feel there's an additional layer now of a, something where you say, I will never do this again. I will now focus more on that. Or do you feel uh, it's a reinforcing your existing work? I think it's, I don't know what, like how the form of my work will change because I'm like, I think we are always like discovering new ways of working and, and new formats and new, um, yeah, collaborations. But I think what reinforces the idea that uh, for me, it's more and more relevant, like who do we share our time with in terms of with whom do we collaborate and for which purpose um, for me it's more reinforcing that these um, projects where like you create the community around the project like we did future land which was a project with unaccompanied minors uh, children or young people who came from syria afghanistan iraq uh, guinea um, and to Germany and they were like without like any net like trying to build up their lives alone with the help of social workers and so on and we did this amazing group of of young people and kids to develop this piece and this was so important for all of mm -hmm. us for them and for me and um, and I think that more and more I think about that this is yeah what I'm more interested in and interested in like sharing these times and creating these communities of people that we can like uh, do something artistic together that can help us to go through this go through this can be many different things mm -hmm. um, so focus in a way a bit on um, um also on community and the people what the work um, is about so I, I know you got a uh, uh, cut short on the, uh, on the launch of your book, uh, which Richard Goth from Performance Research uh, uh, produced and you did in collaboration mm -hmm. with my colleague, uh, Jean Graham Jones. Um, and uh, we talked about it earlier, you, you had some reflections and maybe show us the book and you had some reflections, you know, on, on a future theater. And uh, so let's so we at least see how it looks like. Uh, okay, <laughs> this is from a scene from one of your plays. And it's very, very big. Beautiful mm -hmm. and lots of color. A lot of colorful photographs. Greatly designed. But maybe read us something out of it so we know. What's the idea of the book and the big picture? Is it a retrospective? I mean, it's a, it yeah, so I mean, it's a bit of all the work I did until now. Whoa. Uh -huh. That sounds like I'm already like, uh, yeah, on the end of my career. Wow. <laughs> but it's uh, basically it's like there are essays and um, short texts from other artists and uh, professors and academics and there is also texts of mine there are some scripts scripts of different plays uh, there are a lot of photographs there is interviews a lot of different materials it's really an amazing work like that Jean Graham Jones did for a very long time because she had been editing this book for, I don't know, maybe four years. I was always saying like, but Rick Jean is not ready. We have to do this and that. And Jean was like, Lola, you will never let it go. <laughs> but finally, we let it go and it came out just in March. And then we had the Corona crisis and we couldn't Incredible, but, yes. incredible. But it's, it's going to be a online in the webpage of, um, of uh, performance research uh, books. So, mm -hmm. It's available to buy it's available online. to download. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great, great, great research. Anyway, performance research uh, by Richard. What he puts out, his magazines and the books, is fantastic. But yeah, so maybe read us something from it. And uh, yes, you uh, told me to look for something, and I just found out something five minutes yeah. before we started mm -hmm. this talk, which is at the end of one 
prologue that I wrote to the publication of the trilogy. Uh, and it's a text that talks about like the like how I started theater and and then it goes to how I imagine the theater in the in the future. And it says something like, sometimes I wonder about the future form of theater, about what kind of play I will make before I die. Will it be with actors or robots? Will it be in a theater or in a computer or in an airplane? Will it be like a telepathic experience or a drug given to spectators just before they go to sleep? Mm. <laughs> These are, these are uh, questions we, we all have now, and maybe we even listen listen uh, more careful. Can, so you are in Berlin at the Kreuzberg. What street is it? Or can, can we see out of your window? Meredith Mung once in took her laptop. Is a beautiful street. It's not possible? Yes. Uh, it is possible? Yes, yes. I go. Yeah. I go to the window. The yeah. window so let's see what Lola Aria sees like. Uh, out of I see a lot of trees. That's so beautiful. And ta -da. These are uh -huh. my trees. I so, rediscovered trees. I didn't know the name of any tree before, uh -huh. and now I'm starting to learn very slowly the names of some trees. I realized that there are some castanium in this tree, and also there are cherry blossoms that came from Japan when the re uh, reunification of Germany. And there are others which I still have to learn. I still have a lot of time to learn names. And since trees. how many weeks are you looking at it? Four or five weeks? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, more like at least six weeks, um, or no, even more seven weeks. I think seven yeah. weeks, incredible. It's like the famous paintings of almost every painter, the view out of their studio, um, um, the atelier, which is uh, um, uh, yeah. found in the, the view out into the world from your inner, inner refuge and for your own uh, view. So, this is um, well, this small, but we look a bit more careful. Is there something I mean, we have also many students and young artists um, or for our listeners, is there something where you feel this is an advice, this is something what has been useful for you or what, what should we all pay attention to? What is of significance to keep in mind right now? Um, what is significant to keep in mind? I think it's a moment, it's a nice moment to go a bit back uh, inside of us. I mean, besides being outside, of course, being aware of the social situation, it's also important, but I think it's also an, an exercise that you can do while you like look more inside of you in terms of, I think it's a good moment for, I mean, this, this uh, situation that everybody's posting photos of the past in Facebook or like, recalling situations and so on. I think it's a very interesting thing because we are always so much into the future, like into the what's coming next, that to be a bit like inside and to recall, to rethink, to go back. Um, I think it's so interesting to do that and to take time for that. Um, I think it could make us wiser, but we have to work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And is it, do you listen to music now? Is that do you re reconnect uh, to uh, something? There is something very good that they are doing this live streaming, United with Stream in Berlin. Like they are, like because the clubs are closed, they do like an evening program, and you have like wonderful DJs playing alone for you, and you put it in your living room and you can dance with United with Stream. This is something that I do. Oh, great. So it's the website is www.unitedwestream.com. Yes, I think so too. I'm just, I can check it, but. Okay, good. So uh, all the United listeners. Stream, I think you will find it. You'll find it. United We Stream uh, from Berlin. Uh, from the, so people can dance to the tunes of Berlin yes. anywhere, whether it's in. Uh, in yes, the, United We Stream Australia. Point Berlin. Yes. Point Berlin. Okay. So I will certainly. Um, Check that out. Maybe also for your uh, project, if can people apply to listen to the uh, performance lectures or what's the website? Yes, or how do you sign up? Everything will there... be online in the webpage of uh, Muzontum, which is the main uh, producer. 
of the um, yeah they do fantastic the work performance uh, mm -hmm. yeah so Musonjung is a theater in Frankfurt and they are doing a also a wonderful like program of other um, virtual performances so I think it's very yeah, it's something to look at Musonjung and perhaps if not they yes and also in my web page there will be in your web page lolaarias.com yes. um, yes. you can find it uh, Lola really really um, thank you for taking the time. Uh, to, to speak to us, uh, we all uh, admire your work. Uh, we see we are, uh, up to you. You are a leading voice uh, uh, globally, and it's fantastic that you connected with the great well, Gorky thanks, Theater. Frank. It was really nice and interesting to also to hear you and to connect with so many thoughts. Uh, yeah, that thank you. Also you. bringing from other artists and also mm -hmm. comparing like situations. Uh, reflections of others from all over the world. Thanks. Yeah, so what you do is important and we will watch out for future land and uh, for your for your lecture performance and, and, and all of it. And I uh, want to thank you for taking the time um, and uh, for our listeners, uh, the week will go on them after we heard from uh, Hungary yesterday um, and today from Argentina and Berlin, we will have uh, Mikaela Dragan and Mikaela Mikalov from Romania who will give us an update from uh, what is happening and there we hear again from India. Sulaika Alana uh, will give us a, an update. Carol Martin helped to connect it to her. And then we have a Stacy Klein uh, from the Double Edge Theater who works out of a farm uh, in upstate uh, New York together with Stephanie Monceau from the New York City's Bindelstaff Family Circus. So we also hear from, uh, from uh, communities set of yes. significance, but often a little bit at the at the outsides um, of, of our thinking. I'm a great, great supporter and think also of the circus uh, world. I think it's a form that perhaps as a popular theater form should be looked at it. It's being reinvented in the, at the moment, but also um, work you know, on, in rural sites, developing work in peace and silence and, uh, and, and then sharing it or having a space for others is of significance. And how are they doing? We need to know, I would like to hear. So. Um, Thank you all for listening today. I know how much uh, is out there, how much you all have to do. It means a lot um, to us uh, that you uh, listen to us. And I'm sure also for Lola as everybody else. And we are not alone in this. We are all connected. And I think through our sharing, we understand a little bit better and perhaps we all can cope um, and better with this uh, situation. We also at the Seattle Center are experiencing uh, complications. Our, um, Next Generation Fellow, uh, May Adras, who got a call from the State Department and will have to fly back as we speak at 2.30 to Lebanon in a military plane. And we are completely surprised by this. Um, and we do not understand why. She's a Fulbright scholar, um, Jackie, who helps with all the technology, has a death and her family couldn't join us. So um, these are unprecedented and complicated times. And it's more important than, than ever that we listen and to each other and find find meaning. Thanks to the great HowlRound uh, team, uh, Travis and Thea, to make this happen and having us every day. It's a lot of work for them also to, to hear us on and to the Seagull team of Andy and uh, Sun Yang and Jackie and May. So um, thank you all for listening. And uh, I hope, Lola, we didn't take uh, too much time away from your no, writing in you. solitude yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, all the best. And do come back to the Seagull anytime. And, uh, and I hope to we meet in New York or in Berlin for, for a beer yeah. or a glass of wine. All my best and thank you all for listening and please wow. turn in tomorrow. Stay safe and stay tuned.